Uh, and some of the questions on here are not in the report I just read. And uh, some of them I find interesting. Uh, this one here, number 10, have you told anyone else anything different from what you told the FBI? And then here, have you told any newspaper reporter that you picked up Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, I'd like to know what he answered to those questions, and I'd, I'd like to know why they're asking him that question. I think they're wondering, has he told anybody else this story? Is there anybody else we have to deal with on this matter? And here's another one, which I find very interesting in light of the uh, of the the Oswald sighting I cited earlier at the B and B restaurant. Uh, uh, and I think, as I said, because of the scar on the face, I think that was uh, Ralph Yates. Well, here they ask, have you been inside the Carousel Club? And do you know Jack Ruby? These are questions that we don't have the FBI or anyone else asking him on the record, and we don't have his answers to those questions. And here they are doing a polygraph exam, and presumably he answered those questions, but we don't know what his answers were. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a recording. I don't know. But I haven't found anything. I, I felt lucky that I even found this. So I think the FBI must uh, realize that this is the guy with the scar on his face that uh, that uh, Mary Lawrence uh, had described that she saw with Jack Ruby. Now, I never know what to believe from statements made decades later in the books of authors about the JFK assassination. I have to admit, I have not read many books on this topic. But this is from, uh, this is regarding this, what I'm talking about now, from the Jim Douglas book, JFK and the Unspeakable. And according to him, he interviewed Dorothy uh, Yates, uh, Ralph's wife. Uh, I don't know, it was 40 years later or what. But anyway, uh, during his final January 4th trip to the FBI office, and let me stop right there because that was not his final trip to the FBI office. His final trip was on the 14th. Uh, but anyway, uh, during his final January 4th trip to the FBI office, Ralph Yates was accompanied by his wife, Dorothy. He had asked her to come with him. In an interview 42 years later, she told me what happened next to her husband. After he completed his inconclusive lie detector test, she said the FBI told him he needed to go immediately to Woodlawn Hospital, the Dallas Hospital for the Mentally Ill. Also, I'll note that in the FBI documents, it says he went to Parkland Hospital first and that they referred him to Woodlawn. He drove there with Dorothy. He was admitted that evening as a psychiatric patient. From that point on, he spent the remaining 11 years of his life as a patient in and out of mental hospitals. Uh, a, a crucial transition in the psychic health of Ralph Yates seems to have occurred at the FBI office on January 4, 1964. Something the FBI said after Ralph's polygraph test puzzled and disturbed Dorothy. They told me that he was telling the truth, according to the polygraph machine but that basically he had convinced himself that he was telling the truth. So that's how it came out. He strongly believed it, so it came out that way. According to what the FBI told Dorothy Yates, the data that registered on the polygraph machine, as then read in the normal way by the polygraph examiner, showed that Ralph Yates was telling the truth. His test was officially recorded as inconclusive, meaning the examiner wasn't sure if Yates was telling the truth, only because J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI had decided on what the truth had to be for Yates, and so on. So I thought I should mention this because I saw it, and it purports to be an interview with a witness who was there. Now, I think my explanation of the late of the Yates uh, story uh, explains things that happened afterwards. And um, just to recap my explanation here, uh, Ye Yates did pick up Oswald. Oswald talked too much. Yates uh, called Ruby because 
Yates was a, a good American boy who didn't want the president shot. Uh, Ruby called his handler and told them they had a problem because apparently uh, Oswald uh, revealed too much to Yates. And so this resulted in the conspiracy abandoning the Yates plan. The plan had been for Yates to be the witness that uh, explained how Oswald got the, his rifle to the Texas School Book Depository. So they dropped that and they had to make a new plan. And I think the new plan started with Warren Castor. Warren Castor is the guy who, on uh, November 20th, the same day again, uh, brought two rifles into the Texas School Book Depository building. Did you ever bring guns into the School Book Depository building? Yes, I did. When? I believe it was Wednesday, November 20th, during the noon hour. Whose guns were they? They were my guns. Well, I left the depository during the noon hour and had lunch, and while out for the lunch hour, I stopped by Sanger Harris Sporting Goods Department to look for a rifle for my son's birthday. I beg your pardon, Christmas present. Son's Christmas present. And while I was there, I purchased the single shot, 22 single shot, and at the same time was looking at some other deer rifles. I had, oh, for several years been thinking about buying a deer rifle, and they happened to have one that I liked, and I purchased the 30 6 while I was there. So, he just happens to buy two rifles on the, the same day that Oswald was picked up by Yates with curtain rods on his way to the Texas School Book Depository. That's always seemed to be a very strange coincidence to me. And this is the only time rifles have ever been brought into the building. Two days before the president drove by, Warren Castor brought them in, and Oswald saw this. And that's the only reason that we know about it, because uh, it was uh, disclosed uh, to the police by Oswald that he saw rifles in the building. And so Warren Castor had to be questioned about that. And I think this is the first step in the new plan, the new curtain rod plan. The conspirators know Oswald has his rifle in the Payne garage, and I think this display of guns was used to make Oswald paranoid that he might be set up uh, to be the patsy. So, you know, somebody might have said something to him like, uh, uh, I wouldn't, I better take, yeah, Warren Castor might have said, I better take these home with me tonight. I wouldn't want to leave them here, and somebody might blame me for shooting the president, or, or something like that, and it would have made Oswald very paranoid. And after some comment like that, he would want to go to Irving to check to see that his gun is in the garage where it's supposed to be. And I, I think something like this was done because I don't think Oswald was intentionally setting up himself. I think they were maneuvering, maneuvering him into the Patsy role. And so they got him to go to Irving. And that means that Frazier and his sister uh, can claim to have seen him with a package. Now the reason... Uh, I, I, I think the reason that Frazier... And uh, his sister, Linny May, uh, described a package that was too short, is that they were just told curtain rods. They weren't told how long the package would, should be. They were told curtain rods. And to Frazier, curtain rods meant a particular thing. He told me they were curtain rods. And when I was in high school, I worked at, they used to be called Five and Dime. So there is no more Five and Dime. They're dollar stores now. Uh, and one of my one of my things, one of the, one of the many jobs that I had was that when shipments used to come in, and by that uh, at that time they carried curtain rods in these stores, uh, and one of my jobs was to unpack this stuff. And somebody had had, uh, I guarantee you, someone knew about the size of the curtain rod package. Because when you take the, uh, they're white, you know, and they slide one piece, slides another, and when you get them together, they're only about this long. 
They're not this long, slotted together. They're about this long. Someone had done their homework. And, and that's why the curtain rod package was too small for the rifle. It's because to Fraser, curtain rods are these little, those little flimsy metal things that you, you put up over a window. But curtain rods can be much larger than that, much longer than that. They can be, they're very often, they're round, made of wood. They might be an inch or, or more in diameter. Uh, they could be easily be the size of a rifle, four to four and a half feet long, just like uh, Ralph Yates saw. But Fraser was at a disadvantage because he didn't see any package. He just was told a package of curtain rods. And to him, a package of curtain rods was two feet long. And this mistake occurred because the original plan of Yates being the witness to the curtain rods had to be abandoned and they made a they had to act quick because uh, the president was going to be shot uh, two days later and so uh, they they slapped together this new plan but they failed to, to tell Frazier and his sister that the package was to be uh, four feet long whoops now back to Warren Castor here Castor is an extremely rare name for a person. And there just happens to be another Castor in this story. Frazier's sister, the person, and the two people who saw, who said they saw Oswald with a package, are Frazier and his sister. Frazier's sister, Linny Mae Randall, is married to Bill Randall. And on the day of the assassination, Bill Randall just happened to be out of town on a job uh, with a Barry J. Castor. So, Linny Mae Randall's husband works with a Castor, almost certainly a relative of Warren Castor. And Warren Castor, I think, is the one who started who set the new curtain rod story into motion by getting uh, Oswald to go to Irving so that he could be supposedly seen carrying the curtain rod package by the wife of the man that his relative works with. And while this is a picture of Warren Castor, it's, uh, he's considerably younger in this picture than he was at the time of the assassination. But doesn't he kind of look like somebody? I think so. At least in the eyes a little bit. He certainly could be mistaken for Oswald retrospectively if you had never seen Oswald before and you saw the younger Warren Castor. You might think, oh, that was this guy. Well, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of Barry J. Castor, but people who are closely related often look a, look similar. And it could be that perhaps Barry J. Castor might have been an Oswald uh, double if one had been needed for anything. And this document does say that Barry J. Castor lived in Irving, and there were Irving sightings of Oswald. Particularly that comes to mind for me is... Uh, at the uh, Cliff Shastine, Clifton Chastine Barber Shop. Uh, so anyway, I mean that's very speculative, but I think it might be a possibility that Barry J. Castor uh, could be responsible for some Oswald sightings. Okay, I guess that's about all I can say about Ralph Leon Yates. Uh, I want to make it clear at the end here, if you missed everything else, that I don't think he was a conspirator. I don't think he was responsible for doing anything. I think he was a pawn, an unwitting pawn of the assassination. I think he tried to do right thing, the right thing. I think he tried to tell the authorities, and I think they screwed him over because he was inconvenient. And, uh, well, what's ruining another life when you have a president to murder? <laughs>